We all rely on farmers and ranchers, but farming is riskier than other businesses out there. Crop insurance helps farmers manage their risk. With crop insurance, farmers put skin in the game by paying premiums and shouldering deductibles. That keeps taxpayers from having to pick up the whole bill every time disaster strikes. Today, about 90% of U.S. farmland is insured, providing $100 billion in protection to more than 130 different kinds of crops. It's a testament to the program's success. Thank you for joining us for our AgriPulse Washington Week interview. I'm Spencer Chase, joined as always by AgriPulse Senior Editor Phil Brasher, discussing the week that was, agriculturally speaking, in Washington, D.C. And in Washington, D.C., the tone for the week was set pretty early with the release of uh, President Trump's annual budget. Uh, this budget, as uh, the ones that have come before it from uh, this and other administrations, was met with a level of fire and fury, uh, typically only reserved for the presidential budget uh, within agricultural policy circles. A uh, number of things that came out of there uh, were, were not necessarily Necessarily popular and uh, gave uh, gave the opportunity for a lot of good talking points to be unleashed on Capitol Hill. But uh, Phil, one of the things that we saw was a uh, was some policy, some discussion, some decisions uh, made by the White House in regards to what they would like to see out of uh, crop insurance policy. Oh, they really went after crop insurance uh, in, in, in a number of different ways. One of them cutting the uh, proposing to cut the uh, premium subsidies from from 62% down to 48%, huge, huge cut, which would turn around and increase premiums uh, for farmers uh, dramatically. Um, and a number of other changes, means test uh, and so forth, went off, went after farm bill programs in, in quite a, a number of ways, but a big part of it was, uh, was in crop insurance, as you say. Mm -hmm. And we saw uh, shortly after the, uh, the budget was released, or I guess later that day, uh, we did see House and Senate Agriculture Committee leaders, uh, Pat Roberts and Mike Conaway, uh, release a joint statement saying that uh, they don't anticipate this budget will, will impact their ability to write the, write the new farm bill. But uh, it is an interesting exercise in, uh, in caution to see where the administration or at least some people in the administration with the ability to release a budget stand on crop insurance. Well, the budget director, Mick Mulvaney, has is, is, is clearly got it in for crop insurance, really wants to get money out of that, and that's where they, you know, a lot of, in, a, in real sense, is where a lot of the money is in, in the farm bill, certainly on the commodity section. Uh, we should be very clear with our viewers, this is not going to pass. There will not be a farm bill if they're... Uh, if the House and Senate try to make cuts like that. Mm -hmm. uh, another point is crop insurance does not need the farm bill. Crop insurance is permanently authorized. Uh, even if this uh, farm bill expires, they don't get it done on time, they extend it. Crop insurance is fine, it's permanently authorized. Mm -hmm. And the other point, just to, just to emphasize, the chairman and the ranking members of both the House and the Senate are going to protect this program and they're the ones who are going to be in making the final decisions <laughs> on what is in a new farm bill. Uh, but it certainly gives some um, ammunition to critics of crop insurance when, they, uh, when the farm bills get on the House and Senate floor and you may hear some of them say, look, the president proposed this, it must be a good idea. Mm -hmm. Something else that was in that budget that has gotten a fair amount of attention, not only in, in ag policy circles, but really within the broader uh, Washington media context as well, uh, is a proposal within there to uh, not only I issue some financial cuts to the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, uh, also known as food stamps uh, from its former iteration, uh, but also to reform how the program itself is uh, administered, uh, switching over to a, uh, a blue apron of sorts, as uh, folks have been calling it, where the food would be uh, uh, assigned and picked by the government and shipped to SNAP recipients as opposed to uh, allotting an EBT card as is currently done and allowing the recipients to go out and purchase uh, the products that, he, that they uh, desire that fall within the parameters of the SNAP program. But Phil, man, this thing has taken its lumps here <laughs> here this week in the, in, in the early ongoing discussions of, of the budget deal. Yeah. You would think dead on arrival, uh, given all the criticism of it. Uh, this would be a dramatic reversal. It just came out of left field as far as, as Congress is concerned. Um, the far, the if Food stamps has been the way it is since 1973. Prior to that time, there were some jurisdictions that, that distributed packages of food. It became a cash benefit, if you will, uh, in the form of food stamps initially, now an EBT card. 
uh, back in 1973, and it's been that way ever since. And here we have this uh, proposal on the budget to take half the benefits and turn them into these uh, boxes of food, uh, shelf-stable milk, uh, breakfast cereal, thing, uh, peanut butter, uh, canned fruits and vegetables, things like that. Uh, nothing, nothing fresh like uh, Blue Apron, so it's not really a Blue Apron. Um, however, uh, I said it was. You would think it was dead on arrival. However, I was just talking uh, to uh, uh, the chairman of the House Agriculture Committee, Mike Conaway, and he told me he's uh, has a lot of respect for Secretary Purdue, and he's looking at the idea of doing a pilot project with this. Um, so we could see this. Uh, as a pilot project showing up in the farm bill. Mm -hmm. uh, Secretary Purdue has actually asked about uh, the program this week uh, during his visit in California. A lot of people are kind of wondering where the heck did this come from? It was, took a, a lot of folks by surprise. Uh, Secretary Purdue said this was an idea that came out of the Department of Agriculture, uh, who of course administers the program. And so uh, what kind of legs this proposal will have, uh, be it in uh, future administrative policy, be it in a pilot project in the farm bill, uh, remains to be seen. But uh, it's an idea that's been floated by, uh, by administration leadership and is, uh, as as Phil has reported, being considered uh, by at least House Ag leadership. Uh, remains to be seen what, uh, what the thinking uh, will be in the Senate. But important to note, uh, next week, uh, Congress out of town uh, celebrating uh, President's Day as, as one does. And so they will be out of town. And uh, Phil, when things, uh, when things come back, it really is looking like we're going to start to see things really heat up in terms of farm bill discussion and possibly leading into markup in the, in the weeks soon after they return from recess. Right. Um, we'll have a window, really, the first, uh, first three weeks in March. Uh, then we have a two-week Easter recess. So uh, the big question is whether um, uh, House Agriculture Chairman uh, Mike Conaway can get uh, floor time in the House. He doesn't want to, to bring this bill up in committee and then have it sit around for several weeks uh, uh, for critics to take pot shots at it before it get, actually gets up on the, on the House floor. So it all depends on whether he can get floor time in March. That's going to be tough to do with the, with the other things on the uh, other items on the House agenda. Uh, however, it's still a possibility that the bill could be on the floor, uh, could be in committee, be on the floor in the House in March. Senate's a little uh, farther behind. Um, uh, the chairman of the Senate committee, Pat Roberts, is, uh, uh, tells me he's planning to start briefing uh, uh, members and staff after this uh, recess next week. Uh, they've been working with the min uh, minority side of the committee on, uh, on some of the language. And uh, so they will, uh, they're probably, just given that, probably looking into April and, and May before they can get moving there. But they need to get a bill through the Senate so that they can uh, have uh, uh, some weeks to uh, negotiate a final uh, final bill with the, the House. And even then, it's going to be a very difficult, very challenging thing to do this year. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things, a lot of moving parts going on in farm bill discussions. Uh, that process really starting to get underway. And that's just one of the reasons that I would encourage you to keep an eye on agripulse.com in the next couple of weeks and months just to monitor what's going on here in Washington, D.C., especially if you're a follower of uh, agriculture, food, and farm policy. A lot of things that are going to be going on here in the next couple of months. I think that's going to do it for this week. Uh, uh, there's a he heavy discussion going on all around us, as you may be able to hear. Uh, Senate uh, deciding some things. So uh, it's a uh, Always an interesting time to be in Washington. Or in the case of immigration, not deciding. Yeah, <laughs> semantics. <laughs> Which is what the semantics, Phil. <laughs> semantics. But uh, we better let you go for this week. Uh, for Phil Brasher, I'm Spencer Chase. Have a good one.